things recorded. And um, also, if you can, any so everybody who's on, if you can go into the um, chat and put down your name, your company, and where you're from, and any other pertinent information about what you do in your company, um, that would be great. We're going to share that way instead of doing our usual 20-minute introductions. So um, put it in there and then Fiona will refresh it for anybody who comes in so they see that in there. Um, so a little bit of background to why we're here today. Back in October last year, I had a conversation with Kylie Zager, who's a New York member. Uh, she's a CEO at Aspira Health. And she and I um, talked about this topic, about bringing it to the global meeting because we it's been around the topic in some re respects at some of the other chapters, but we hadn't really talked about it here at the global meeting. So I kind of went on my way after my conversation with Kylie and started looking for some experts on this topic. And I ran across Chris, Chris's profile and I reached out and she and I had a conversation. And one of the things that she said to me was that women in the workforce is one of her favorite topics. And she was more than happy to have a conversation with us about that. So um, she's here. And that was back in October when we first talked. I don't know if you remember, it was that long ago, Chris, and you've done some traveling and other things in the middle of all that. Um, but I'm glad that she's here. So I'm going to give you just a little bit of background to her, some of what is, was and was not shared in the, the meeting invite. Um, but Dr. Chris is um, an industrial organizational psychologist. She serves as an adjunct faculty for both Purdue University Global and Grand Canyon University, all from her home in Scottsdale, Arizona. Uh, she works with students in the behavioral health leadership program, teaches courses on um, acting um, as capstone mentor and chairs students to work through the capstone projects. She has over 20 years of teaching and facilitating experience, both corporate and university settings, focusing specifically on women in the workforce, emotional intelligence, change management, assessment creation and administration, and mindset theory. She's a member of the American Psychological Association and the Society of Industrial Organizational Psychology, a top 10 nominee for the Athena International Women's Leadership Award, the author of three published books, and is a CEO of the Wayfarer Group, a consulting and executive coaching firm that she established in 2003. She's worked with Fortune 100 companies globally, served on several board of directors for local nonprofits, and spent four years as vice president and president of the Board of Education in Cecil County, Maryland. Dr. Sopa is currently doing research on the gender communication gap in the post Me Too era and how it affects gender communication in the world of work, as well as research on how organizations manage and move through change. Um, at this time, I would love to hand this over to Christine and uh, get us started on what's going to be, I'm sure, a wonderful conversation and time with time together today. It's all yours. Awesome. Awesome. And if you want to, um, Fiona, you can go ahead and share the poll and I'll kind of explain what it is. And if you want to, Laura, share the presentation, that would be great. So hello, everybody. I am so excited to be here with all of you today. Um, Laura, thank you for that great introduction. Mm -hmm. I'm taking you on the road with me to, to, to do that. That was fantastic. I really appreciate it. Mm -hmm. This is definitely a topic I am super passionate about, um, so much so that in 2016 and 17, I spent two years researching it for my dissertation for my PhD. It is a topic that comes up no matter what I go into an organization for, whether it's change management, leadership development, um, executive hiring, whatever it is, this topic usually comes up. And it is one that I love to talk about. I stay on top of this topic more probably than any other, just because I work so much with executive women. And so this discussion we're going to have today, I have a lot of information to share, but I do want this to be a discussion. I want to hear your thoughts on this. I want you to agree. I want you to disagree. I want you to question because a lot of the things I talk about are things maybe you've heard before, but then my viewpoint on some of them might not be your traditional viewpoint. And so I want to hear your thoughts on this because my goal is to get you thinking about this topic, um, be creative, think outside of the box of ways we can all work together. Because the thing that I have learned the most about women in the workforce and the changing dynamics of this is that we cannot do it alone. It is not a women have to do this in order to get to point B. It is we all have to do it together. And that is organizations, men, everybody works together. And it's really the same with anything we see in our society, but especially this one. So the question that you see 
in front of you today is I'm wanting to just hear from you one or two words, nothing, you know, huge. We don't need a paragraph here, but if you could change one thing, if you had a magic wand, men and women, and you could change one thing about the gender disparity in the workforce that we see today, what would it be? And I want to hear all of your answers here. So I'll give you a second to do that. And as you are typing, I do want to give you a mindset I would like you to have throughout this presentation. Um, this, you know, women have a growing global influence, and we do this through the organizations we work in. We do this through the, you know, entrepreneurs and businesses that we start, and we help create new jobs. We help grow the economy. We help reduce unemployment. We are a moving force. And one of the things as I was doing research on this topic that I noticed myself was that there is very little research in this space that doesn't compare women to men. There's very little research on women alone in this space. And so I am hoping to change that as I kind of move through all of the discussions I have with organizations. But during this talk, what I would love for you to have as a mindset is this. And so men, I want to talk to you first, because I do want to address something, even though we're talking about women, um, men have their own stereotypes and their own issues they deal with. You know, I think men really get a bad rap. I am not um, the feminist, the, oh my gosh, it's all about women. I am always very balanced in my thinking around this because I do see men get a very bad rap as well. And so again, this needs to happen together. So what I'd like the men to do is as we go through these topics, I would like you to pay attention to a couple of things. I want you to pay attention to what you can learn from women both personally and in the workforce. And then as you hear some of the things we talk about, where can you help or support these women? And then women, I want you to do the same thing for men. I want you to listen to the conversation. And I want you to think about where can I learn from men? What can I learn from them about their mindsets and how they work? And then where can you help support the men in this movement as well? All right, can we all do that? And I'm a super interactive speaker, so I kind of need to see faces and all of that fun stuff. So Fiona, how are we doing on the results here? We've got nine of 19. Nine of 19. So can you show what we have so far? And then maybe, let's see. There we go. Wages and sponsoring, okay. Removing the gender pay gap. Hiring and supporting women. Whoops, we went away there. <laughs> I think you're sharing your screen still. I don't know if that's Laura. There we go. We kind of lost the results, but that's okay. Can you read some of them off, Fiona? I actually, oh, can't see them. Oh, you can't see them. Oh. Okay, here we go. Okay, so wages and sponsoring, um, assumed motivators. Yeah, not always money, and that is so true. Removing the pay gap, hiring and supporting women in senior leadership. Yep, championing their ways of leading. I love that. More women in leadership roles um, and involved in the strategic decision-making. Yep, the traditional view of what a great leader is. Yep, absolutely. I hear that quite a bit. Not just more women, but women of color and exec ranks. Absolutely, that's a big one as well more willingness to train versus hiring people with experience, very good. Um, and then parental responsibilities. This is a big one right now. Often women are required to be caregivers of their children and partners. Yep, yeah, and that one has become full in the spotlight since the pandemic for sure. So if you could go back, Laura, to the presentation, that would be great. So as we, begin to move into this topic, there are two things that have recently affected the dynamics of women in the workplace. And that is obviously the COVID pandemic and then the Me Too movement. And both of these have affected our roles as women in the workforce and our trajectory forward in positive and negative ways. And so I wanna talk about the pandemic first. I wanna share some stats with you. So if you can go to the next slide, Laura. So a couple things with the pandemic. Um, 
the pandemic obviously affected all of us, men, women, doesn't matter. But for women in particular in the workforce, what it did is it kind of pulled us back quite a bit. Um, it affected the employment of women more than men. Two and a half million women actually left the job market. Now, 1.8 million men also left as well, but you see that there's a big disparity there between the two. Um, women's labor force participation between January of 2020 and January of 2021 declined by 1.8%, which halted any gains we've made. And we make gains in this area very slowly anyway. And so what the pandemic did is it pulled us back a little bit as well. Um, you know, with men in particular with this, what I want you all to remember again is the difference in how men and women perceive and look at things in the workplace, okay? Because there is a difference here and I'll continue to talk about that as we move forward because I think that's, that's going to help the perception on both sides. So Laura, if you can go to the next one. Some other stats here. So for women who did remain in the workforce, and this actually touches on um, a couple of the things that were just said in the poll, additional caregiving um, labor increased due to schools being closed. I know many of you experienced that. I watched my daughter experience that with my grandson. And because I was home, I was able to help her quite a bit. Um, Childcare closures and then caring for older relatives. A lot of this fell onto the women, which, feeds directly into that 2.5 million that you see left the workforce. I watched single mothers like my daughter, who if she wouldn't have had me, I don't know what she would have done because it was between, okay, my son is home at school or home, you know, doing homeschooling, but I have to go to work to feed the family. And there were so many families and women in that space. 36% of women um, said they had a great deal more responsibility at home compared to 16% of men. With that statistic, came what I am seeing the most right now in organizations is this dramatic increase of burnout and stress. How many of you kind of raise your hand here? How many of you have noticed that either yourself an increase in burnout and stress, or you have seen that with people around you? I, probably almost every hand can go up. I mean, that was an absolute huge one and one that we're still dealing with. Um, in April of 2020, close to half of all the mothers of school-aged children reported at least some symptoms of psychological distress. This, this has been huge, um, and it has been a topic that I think I've been called on more than anything on, hey, what do we do? How do we change our culture? Because this isn't so much now just certain individuals in an organization experiencing burnout and stress. This has become almost an epidemic in organizations where they're realizing we have to change our culture in order to change the trajectory trajectory of how this is going. Okay. Um, the difference in how people are handling this as well, what we're seeing from a psychologist perspective and all of the studies that have been done in the last couple of years is this is now the psychological distress on women in particular is having long-term effects on women's health, on their mental health, on their physical health, and how they are in the workforce as well. All right, so this is a big, big deal here. So I wanna pause for a moment, if you could go to the next slide, Laura, and I wanna hear a little bit about your experiences so far through the pandemic. So any specific experiences you want to share as far as burnout, stress, um, childcare and what you had to do differently? And then how does your life look different now? And this might work better if anybody wants to come on audio rather than use the chat. So I wanna hear from you. How does your life look different now? What were some of your experiences? And don't be shy. Here, I guess my experience when the pandemic first hit, um, I'd say my experience was actually pretty miserable and I would say I, I ended up being very angry uh, because I was at the same time leading my company through transitioning online and we we're running a school. Um, I had no childcare all of a sudden um, and everything was in crisis. We collapsed half the company under me to lead through strategically and I found myself that we were almost grief counselors like my role had moved yeah. into grief counseling. Uh, because it wasn't just that we were supporting our students, our adult students in the space, but the staff were also figuring out what the pandemic meant for them and they were trying to have the capacity. Um, and that I'd say I lasted about three months and I actually went through the process of 
I don't know if I can actually stay in the workforce. Um, and then I was very angry that the decision, if one of us had to stay home, had to be me just based on practical potential financial numbers and, and security of role. And this was just before I was like on the path to being COO first time in this company. And I went, I don't know that I can stay on this path. Um, and it was, a, I ended up staying on that path. I got as far as writing my resignation letter to see what it would feel like. Uh, Cause I just didn't see that I was not functioning well. I'm someone who can typically push through. I can handle a lot. It's kind of part of my, it's been part of my thing and my body just wouldn't let me. Right. And it was just like, nope, you actually can't like not process the day. And I was just dealing with a lot of things I had never experienced before. My life looks very different now. I'm obviously still in meetings like this and I have done very well in my role and I've very much shifted our entire company on what it means to take care of our people in that time because of my own experience. And I was mm -hmm. very, even in my role, I was very frustrated that I wasn't the first person who was bringing a lot of those things forward, but it took me saying, I can't do this anymore to really shift that change. Um, and it's definitely made my life better. And I can say most people, my company's life better in terms of how we even just plan for the unpredictability of what a pandemic does. So very personal and professional impact from the last two years. Yeah. And Nicole, my gosh, thank you for sharing. You touched on so many great things there and how courageous for you, because I think the hardest thing for women, because we're so used to pushing through and having to put on that strong face, especially in the workforce to be vulnerable and say, Hey, I can't do this because so many women were there. They reached their threshold. You know, I always talk Talk about emotions like we have a vessel in our body you know and just like your physical body has to release things you know in order to stay functioning emotionally we have to release things as well and for women we tend to collect our emotions you know even though we're good from an emotional intelligence standpoint we tend to have this mask on where we have to be strong all the time and we put the emotions in this vessel and what happens is they get to a level where they just explode where no more can get in and that sounds like that's what happened to you it's like it was just i just can't do it anymore and you were not alone in that and congratulations for persevering but you, you told that so eloquently thank you so much because i think your story is echoed with a lot of women out there anybody else want to share their experiences through the pandemic I'll chime in. Um, the it was it was definitely rough. I hated hearing all of the people. Um, I'm so bored and I don't know what to do. And I'm like, I am so far from bored. You got to be kidding me. Nothing slowed down. I got really frustrated about all those people, bored people, because mm. nothing nothing slowed down for me. Yeah, I have my kids are thankfully older, so it wasn't as bad. But you had to keep them going. Um, middle school and high school, so mm -hmm. I had to keep them going through that. Um, so, but it was a little bit easier. I did have elderly parents that I had to yeah, um, yeah. take care of. And so I was the only kid locally. So I had to be, I was that sandwich generation dealing with that. So that was definitely rough. So, but survived. Um, I thankfully I do work for a good organ, a organization that we were trying our best and really working and trying to take care of the employees and keep the communication going as much as possible. So there was a lot of understanding and support, which was great. Mm -hmm. The question that was interesting on the how, how does your life look different now? Um, it got us to be fully remote. Um, we were struggling with that kind of that that push between in the office that no, you can be remote, but no, 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 you really need to work in the office. Mm -hmm. um, and this really forced that change to really happen in our CEO to embrace the remote workforce. And what's really different now is, oh, we do actually get rain in California. My kids bike to school. It's like, there's not that stress now of uh, how am I going to get to my kids to school? Because I work now most of the time from home. I do go into the office office, but I don't have to panic over, oh, is it going to be bad if I don't go into the office today? No, I can hop out, get my kids to school, and then actually get them in the afternoon again, or doctor's appointments is something as stupid as getting, mm -hmm. taking care of doctor's appointments. I used to, the traffic was so bad. I had to like leave the office at almost like three o'clock in the afternoon, just to barely make a 430 appointment or something. So the the hopping out to get to appointment because you had to try all that timing. Mm -hmm. So, um, and I, I do have another, a coworker that kind of, we were chatting about this. I think it's definitely different for a lot of women now. She was saying, I can get my kids to after school programs. I couldn't do that before. Yep. So even if you had the date, a lot of us working moms have your kids in daycare situations and you feel bad that they can't 
take advantage of all of these other programs. So I do feel like, or there's, there are um, both um, uh, mom and dad or partners or whatever, both are at home. And so there's a little bit more of the sharing of a, uh, hey, I can go grab the kids now. And there's um, tag teaming on pickups now so that the workforce is a lot more distributed than it was prior. So I do feel like there's been a slight shift um, but a lot more flexibility that I just didn't, I don't feel like I had before. Yeah. And that's actually relieved a lot of that, that pressure of being able to go and um, hop out to do miscellaneous things. Yeah. And that is a great point, Kat. Thank you so much, because that is a positive from the pandemic. I think a lot of organizations, I know that they felt the same way that yours did is they say, oh, you can work remote, but not really. <laughs> and part of it was they didn't know how to measure productivity. And there were all of these stereotypes and assumptions around working remotely. And so the pandemic kind of forced us to figure that out. One of my colleagues is a workforce futurist. And I remember when the pandemic started within the first two months, one of the things she said to me was she said, Chris, all of the technology advancements that we weren't supposed to see for another eight to 10 years, we're immediately seeing now because of the pandemic. And I think this remote working piece was one of those. So Kat, thank you for sharing. Can I hear from one of the men? I would love to hear from one of the men to see what your experience during the pandemic was like. And if you see anything different now. I can chime in. Um, the, um, so I became COO in November before all this came. So it was a nice indoctrination to running operations while we were also trying to grow and bring on a new retail customer. So. My experience during the pandemic was, I just, I can't think about an hour from now, it was really, I'll just take one step at a time. Mm. Um, and yeah, it's a lot of from what other you were hearing here, just a lot of grief and how do we handle this? We're a manufacturing operations, so we didn't have the option to send a lot of people home. So we still had 250 people here on campus in Oceanside, California, that they gotta run, we gotta keep yeah. running. So, um, so it's been a grind, uh, growth, um, so high 30% growth in kind of each of the years during this. So I think now we're, how does it look different now? I mean, thankfully I have a wife, she took care of the kids. One of my sons fired my wife teaching during the early part of the pandemic and I got <laughs> caught or I was told to teach him. Um, I got fired and I wrote a note to the teacher. If you don't pass them, I don't care. <laughs> uh, we're just, it's just not happening. Um, he made it to the sixth grade. Um, now it's, you know, we're a privately held company, so we're, the owners are back to thinking, we don't need to do this remote thing anymore. We need to, I want to see people tangibly in their seats mm -hmm. um, here, even though we're, I would say, wildly productive in the current format of kind of four days, three days here to one day off, whatever it works for the individual. Uh, we know what you need to do. You know what you need to do. Just get your work done and on we go, but it's not a widely shared um, belief. So we're working through that. And I think we're also now just experiencing kind of just fatigue, uh, two years of just grinding through. It's one thing we got through, but it was also just grinding with growth. Um, and so now it's keeping people motivated a little bit as, you know, things are slowing a little bit for us, not breakneck pace. So I'm feeling the air come out of the sails a little quicker of for a lot of people, oh, maybe we yeah. can take a break now. So yeah, those are my no, thoughts. That is great. Thank you, Lindsay. And you touched on a couple things too. So one of the things with some organizations and are like, hey, we are, we're ready to move back into the office. And what I'm hearing a lot is people who have now been used to the lifestyle of working from home where they have different priorities now, because as Kat was saying, she can take her kids to school and not stress and go to doctor's appointments. They're like, I don't want to go back. I want to stay working from home. And so organizations are facing that. The fatigue is a huge piece as well, because I think we were all grinding through COVID and through the pandemic. And now as things get back to normal, it, it all starts to catch up. But then the grief part, you know, I, I want to talk about that because I think all three people mentioned the grieving. Grieving doesn't just happen when someone passes away. Grieving happens when there's a change and a loss. And it's something I talk about quite often when I talk about change in an organization and helping people move through that. And women and men grieve very differently. So there was a recent study. My daughter actually brought this up to me the other day. Um, 
And this is a big difference between how men and women cope with grief. And this is one of those things that when I mentioned earlier, how men, you know, have their own things that they deal with, just like women do. When women are grieving, one of the things we do is we want to talk to our female friends. You know, we, we usually like to talk about it and express it and, and have that conversation. And the study that was just done interviewed a bunch of men and they said, hey, when something horrible happens in your life, like just tragic, you know, who do you talk to first? And every single one of the men said no one. Every single one of the men said no one. And that, that literally almost made me cry because I'm thinking of all of the things we've been through through COVID, all of us. And that coping mechanism, I think, is missing for men. And a lot of them said that they talk to no one because like, hey, I'm supposed to look strong. I'm supposed to look like nothing is, is, is moving me you know, on the mountain, um, which is not necessarily true. So thank you, all of you that participated in that and shared your experiences, because I think we all can kind of echo that. So pandemic, we could probably talk about that all day. But Laura, if you could go to the next slide for me because the other experience that happened um, was the Me Too movement, all right? This was a huge movement that happened through 2017, started a little bit before, really reached its peak in 2018. And I can tell you that although this was an important movement for women to speak up around sexual harassment, it did dire damage to women as well in the workforce, and this is why. And so this is from not only research from the Harvard Business Review, but research I've done on my own in this area. Conversations with men, conversations with women, conversations in organization. But since the Me Too movement, statistically, less men and women hire attractive women and just women in general. They're hesitant, men are hesitant to be alone in a room with a woman. Um, they're hesitant to have a one-on-one -on -one meeting with a woman without someone else present. They're hesitant to mentor women. And I've heard so many men say this, I used to love mentoring women and helping you know, them with the skills and knowledge they need in the organization. And now I, I don't even wanna mentor women anymore. I'm afraid to be alone with them one-on-one. -on -one. Um, some men even said to me you know, that I was interviewing that I, I'm afraid to even give a woman a compliment at work and tell her she looks nice. I'm afraid it's gonna be taken differently. And then less men are now including women in social interactions and events just because of this whole movement as well. I had a friend who um, I do this research with, he's also an IO psychologist. He had an experience around this time where he was walking into Starbucks and there was a woman coming towards him that had a bunch of things in her arms and he just simply opened the door for her and she proceeded to bite his head off and said, I can get the door myself. You don't need to hold it for me. And he came back to me and he was like, what did I do wrong? I'm like, you didn't do anything wrong. It's this communication gap. I think that's happened now. It's these assumptions and, and all of this that have really hurt us moving forward. And there's a lot of studies out there right now on this movement um, and that they've done since because the Harvard Business Review actually revisited this. They did this study in 2018 and then they went back and revisited this in 2019 when things had settled down quite a bit. And they still found that 19% of men were reluctant to hire women. 21% were reluctant to hire women for um, close interpersonal interaction jobs and inviting them to events. And 27% said they avoided one-on-one -on -one meetings with women. And so, you know, there's a rule, I don't know if you guys saw this, a lot of men are saying that they follow the Mike Pence rule. And so the Mike Pence rule is Mike Pence actually during this time said he would not have a meeting with a woman without his wife present. And it became kind of coined as the Mike Pence rule. And so a lot of men now are feeling like, you know, I just you know, either, either not necessarily your wife has to be there, but someone else needs to be in the room. And so this, this shift put us back as well, even though again, the Me Too had great things that came of it, gave women a voice. It also stepped us back. So I'm just gonna pause for a minute. I saw some things come through the chat. Just want to hear um, what anyone have, if you guys have had any experience with this at all. And if you've noticed this at all, and, and men, I'd love to hear from you here. If you have experienced and, and kind of agree with any of these where since this movement, you're a little hesitant or maybe not. What do you think? I think it's, you know, each person's a little bit different on, you know, what they learned early on in their career, especially in, you know, corporate America and how to, you know, behave. And, you know, I was always given advice that 
be extra cautious at the office, you know, especially when you're interacting with different cultures, not, not just women, but, you know, different cultures and things like that on um, compliments and things like that. Um, sometimes just different um, dialects that people have. I'm from the Northeast part of the country. When I came to the South, there were things that, um, you know, I didn't necessarily know uh, may offend someone, but, you know, turned out that it could. I got some advice on that from people when I came to the South. And so I've always kind of taken that cautious view of it that if I'm not really sure that I, I normally won't say it. And as I build relationships with different people and I get to know them and they know my personality and things that I say, um, you know, I'm a little bit more free to open up and, and things like that. But, you know, I've definitely been cautious. Um, I will agree though, that the movement itself, you know, when I look at some of the people that I worked with and bosses that I had and things, and, and I would see, you know, some of their behaviors and some of the things that they said, you know, and, and I would be like, wow, I can't believe they said that, you know, and each person dealt with it differently. You know, some women were very direct back at the person and some people kind of laughed it off like, haha, that's, you know, Fred being Fred or, you know, something like that. But, you know, I was always like, wow, I, I can't believe he said that, you know, especially at work. So, um, but it's definitely a real thing. And um, I know I have friends that, you know, have different opinions on that and, mm -hmm. and feel that it doesn't make sense and things. But, you know, I think when you see it, you know, and you've heard it, you know, in your career, you realize like, okay, there's a reason that this movement started and, you know, we have to better understand each other and, mm -hmm. you know, prevent ourselves from going to, to, you know, to some of these areas where, you know, it's just, it's, it's not appropriate in the work workplace. So, yeah. Um, Great. Thank you, Mike. Yeah, and again, it's that communication gap, I think, that's happened. And, you know, I was having a conversation with my COO, Tommy, who's actually on the call, and she made a really great point when we were talking about this at one point. And she said, you know what, what I think probably is happening is all of these things that are listed on this slide, the men who wouldn't really have made those rude comments or the things like Mike, you're saying that you witnessed are the ones that are probably more hesitant and the guys that are maybe doing it are still doing it. Yeah. <laughs> and so it's the guys that really weren't really the issue anyway, who've now become even more cautious because they were cautious and respectful before. So again, another topic we can get super into, but I do, I did want to bring it up because since we're talking about changing dynamics in the workplace, these are two things that over the last few years have drastically changed the dynamics for us um, in one way or another. And to my point earlier is they've also had some positive things as well. All right. So let's shift now to some traditional um, thoughts and some traditional research on women in the workforce and what they've experienced. And Laura, if you can go ahead and move that slide. So traditionally from research, and I, a lot of this is from my own research um, and, re and a lot of the studies that, that I looked at when I was doing my dissertation, women traditionally have received less training in these areas you see here in leadership and mentoring and strategy and negotiations and coaching and team building. The two I see the most are the strategy and negotiation one. And so they haven't seen and really had opportunities as much in the past to receive the skills and knowledge they need in these areas. And then if you put them in specific industries, specific industries, it's even worse. And so if you look at um, technology, um, manufacturing, the energy space, um, food and beverage, insurance industry, which I worked in for a while, some of those that are traditionally kind of more top heavy with the males, women have found this even more so. Laura, if you could go ahead. And in society's eyes, and so when you talk to, and you go outside of corporate and you talk to society, a lot of the research shows that in society's eyes, women in general, when we ask about, hey, when you think about a woman, a woman in leadership compared to a man in leadership, what are the differences? And this is what people have said. They've said, well, women really don't have what it takes to succeed. They don't really have the personality characteristics of a leader. Um, they're lacking education and training. Um, they don't have many access to role models and mentoring, which is very true. And they don't have the same ability to strategize and negotiate. 
And so when you see this, and when you see that this is something that women are falling short on, and it's also perception, because that perception is our reality and perception is everything. And that perception is something that needs to shift in this space for things to start to change. Because if people walk around with this perception, no matter what women are doing and no matter how many gains we're making, this will still be the reality. And so the challenge is, is changing the cultures and changing the perceptions. So this is no longer the case. Now we've seen movement forward in this. I personally work with a lot of organizations that are starting to change their cultures. They are creating internal leadership programs for women to help them build those skills and that knowledge um, and change their mindsets around some of these things. But remember the programs themselves, you can bring in as many programs and educational things as you want into an organization. And that's great. And we need that. What those do is those help with the skills the knowledge and mindset, but it doesn't change the culture and it's changing the culture and organizations and that perception overall in society that helps us move forward in this area. I'm going to just pause for a minute to see if there's any comments there on that, either in the chat or if anyone wants to come on audio. And then Laura, you can go to the next slide as well. All right, so some daily issues that women face and, and ladies feel free to chime in here because um, there's a whole bunch that I don't have on here that I'll talk about as well. But some of the things we face daily, burden of being the primary caregiver and the kind of go-to, and you've heard that in some of the comments so far today, um, we've got that proverbial glass ceiling with what we can make as far as wage disparities, less opportunity for advancement and less roles available for us to move up the ladder. Um, negative perceptions, as you just heard, of women in leadership, harassment, which came out with the Me Too movement, um, and then deep-seated biases and stereotypes of women in the workforce. What are some other ones that you feel women face on a daily basis? So ladies and men, chime in here. What are some other ones? feel free you can stick those in the chat or you can go on audio I want to hear from you i just had an experience um so i feel really fortunate the company that i'm with right now is uh doing uh, everything they can to bring in more women and of course they hired me mm -hmm. and um uh but it's funny because there are little things that happen that you just go oh guys that was so bad and an example was I was in a meeting, all C-suite and two consultants. And one of the, you know, we're all remote and the, the CTO had to pop off to get something that was happening in his house. It was urgent. And the CEO goes, um, oh, that's okay. We'll take a second. I hear Deborah has a great voice and we'll have her sing to us while we're waiting. And I was <laughs> like, uh, yeah, that's not happening. And, uh, but it was just like, when I, when I brought it to him later, I just said, I just want you to see that this happened. He was devastated. Oh, yeah. Yeah. But it just came out. I, you know, who knows why that might be the deep seated biases or stereotypes point, but I wanted to mention, cause it just happened like a week ago. Yeah. Yeah. Now that's a, that's a really great example that kind of goes both ways too. Um, with what we've talked about, but yeah, so that that's the deep seated stereotypes. Any other things that that you've seen? And Deborah, that was a great example. Thank you. I'd like to chime in, uh, Dr. Chris. So you know, I'm a, um, a deep seated Gen Xer, not giving up my entire age, but um, you know, I, I have um, you know female relatives that are older than me that. Um, uh, when I mention um, different uh, women that I work with uh, in leadership positions, like, wow, you have, uh, uh, you know, women doing that, you know, <laughs> like, it's almost like women from the generation before me are still part of the, the bias problem that, uh, uh -huh. that is contributing to uh, some of our challenges today. So I'm, I'm kind of curious as to what uh, the newer generations are seeing, are they seeing these same, same types of, you know, uh, comments being made or biases from from before. Yeah, and that's a great point, Chuck, with the generations, because I'm 
firmly in the Gen X or two without, <laughs> you know, giving my age, although we were having a menopause conversation earlier, <laughs> me and Laura. But anyway, um, that is interesting because the millennials and I think the Gen Zers probably have a different viewpoint as well um, on this. And that that's a great point with research, which we don't have a ton of time to go into here, but it is it is something that I think they I've noticed look at a little bit differently with this. Um, so that's an excellent, excellent point. Um, issues, some other issues I know that I've seen that women face, and I had mentioned this earlier, is we have a lack of role models of women at the top that we really can look at and, and go, gosh, how is this done? How did you handle this? Um, misaligned incentive structures. There's in some industries more than others, there's kind of the men's, you know, club that they have to deal with in the culture, um, the, the golf outings, all of that, that they're not invited to. And there's just kind of the secret men's club in some industries. Um, there's the gendered media depictions. There's the 24 seven work culture, which I think that was one piece that really got highlighted during the pandemic because a lot of folks that weren't used to working from home, our boundaries get very blurred. And we've kind of felt like, gosh, I don't know where the off switch is. You know, where before the off switch could have been when you gotten in your car and you were driving home. And now all of a sudden, where's that off switch? And so a lot of folks that 27, uh, 24 seven work culture was really highlighted. Um, and then there's this female confidence gap that we deal with on a regular basis. And so that is the mindset piece that I work a lot with, with women in organizations is this confidence gap and this imposter syndrome, which we're going to talk about in a little bit, because that is, um, that's actually a topic of my next book um, is imposter syndrome. And that is something that I see with men and women as well. That's huge. So these are just some daily things that, that women deal with that I think men deal with as well. Um, to a certain extent. Um, and I just want to make sure, Laura, let me know if I'm missing anything in the chat there. And you can go ahead and go to the next slide. Some of the barriers that have prevented us from entering, remaining in, and re entering the workforce. And then if you put the Me Too movement and the pandemic on this, is lack of having childcare, lack of available jobs, lack of paid sick leave, and lack of flexibility in the workplace. Um, this lack of flexibility in the workplace is something that I think has shifted because of the pandemic in a really great way. Um, I, I saw a really great comment coming through here. Um, Sharitha, I see awesome female execs second guess their gut instinct. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. And that happens a lot. I work with a lot of people from a coaching perspective on that too, of not trusting their gut and speaking up and, and finding their voice. So that is so true. But these are some of the barriers that have prevented us from moving into um, the workforce, remaining in it, and then re-entering it if we've had to have left. Like a lot of women that have left now to re-enter, it's hard. This childcare piece is real. I remember when, I mean, my girls are 30 and 28 now, okay? So they're older. But when my girls were little and I was working full time, it was not an option for my husband to take off. So for me, you know, I was always the one that had to take off. And I remember having this deep seated guilt all of the time because the organization I worked for at the time, even though we had sick time, we got these demerit points every time we took it. So it's like you have it but there was a system in place that kind of punished you for taking it. And so every time one of my girls woke up sick, it was always this dilemma of, do I risk my job and get a demerit and call out sick? Or do I send my kid to school sick? It's like, oh, her fever's only 102. She'll be fine. <laughs> you know, and you hate that. You hate having that. But I think a lot of women have experienced that as well. Um, and so hopefully this is starting to shift a little bit and we're seeing some things shift within, within the pandemic. Laura, go ahead to the next slide. So this hey, is actually- hey, hey, Dr. So can I ask you a question? Yeah, absolutely. How did, your, how did your husband and you decide that was the correct path to go where you would be the one doing that? Well, he's not my husband anymore, which is the beauty of divorce. But, <laughs> um, we, we didn't really. Um, and it was just the dynamics of our relationship. It was just, he, um, he didn't even really have a, a high ranking position. It was just kind of like his, he was very passionate about his work. And honestly, to, to be really transparent and honest, I never spoke up. I always kind of felt like it's my role as the wife and the mother. 
um, to do this. And so part of my owning of that is I never actually brought that to the table to have that discussion. So that's a really great question. And yeah, it's a good that up. The, the, yeah, there's a reason I bring it up because, you know, I'm pretty much the primary caretaker in my family. And, you know, mm-hmm. um, you know, my kids just walked in, I work from home and my, my wife has an office job, whatever. Mm-hmm. And, you know, even when I had an office job, you know, and, you know, we kind of came to the decision together and mm-hmm. she also felt guilty about like the things, but we, you know, we had the discussion about it. Right. So, you know, for us and, you know, it's hard to, you know, from my perspective, I know it's going to be an unpopular thing for some of these guys, but if the discussions had and the decisions they could, you know, for whatever reason that the woman, that's the woman's responsibility in, in, in marriage and in, as a parent, you know, sometimes it's a guy's responsibility, you know, Mm-hmm. I face the same barrier for entry that you do, right? About like Trump taking care of my children. Like, right? if my kid's home from sick, home sick, well, I work from home, so it's my responsibility. I'm the one of those to cancel meetings. I'm the one of those to cancel these things, right? Yeah. So, you know, and you know, I, I may be, you know, the you know the unicorn here because I've never felt like a woman can't do as much as a man can. You know, I, I think you know there's physical limitations for for everyone. There's there's mental limitations for everyone, and you know, it, you know, I've never been one to say, hey, you can't do that because you're sex or your gender or whatever, whatever you yeah. are. So like, you know, I don't really, under, you know, the concept of it to me, it's a bit far and I understand, like I've seen it come through where in the fifties, it was like, it was the housewife, the man goes to work, whatever. But, you know, as society's progressed where there's been more of a, you know, a dual income setup, or, you know, even if it's like, you know, parents are separated and it's a mother father set up, you know, mm-hmm. they're, they're, if, it, whatever the setup is, if it's not discussed and it's just assumed, you know, I, I've seen like my, my my friends have been blamed for that same exact thing you're saying, right? But again, he, he made the assumption and she made the assumption, yeah. And it was just the accepted way. So is that a stigma of it's the guy's fault or is it both of their fault, right? right. So is the barrier That's is the point. barrier that because the barrier there to me is both their faults were not communicated mm-hmm. and they just went through the assumption, right? Yep. So, you know, I've seen it the other way too, where the guy has been home, so the woman's had a more predominant job. And, you know, it just made the assumption and he was bitter about it, but, you know, he never spoke up. So I don't know if it's a gender thing. And I know it's changed a lot now that we've been working home. And, you know, after COVID, it's probably going to be one complete 180 after we come out of this, right? Because more people still work from home. Mm-hmm. But, you know, I think that might actually help the whole gender equality in the workforce from that perspective, because there is more work from home options, right? Yeah, you know, you know, I, would, my, I would agree. But for instance, my company is, is all like, you know, cybersecurity engineers. And of the hundreds of resumes I've seen, I've seen one female, one. Mm-hmm. And not, so it's not a lack of, you know, and we, we spoke with her and she said, this is not what she's looking for. So mm-hmm. she removed herself from the process, right? Yep. So is it a barrier of entry or there's just not anybody taking that stuff from the field that they're just not getting that they're that there's just not an opportunity for us to hire them as well. Yeah. And right? I think it's a combination of of both because you're making some excellent points here. I think with that in particular, it goes back to the skills and knowledge conversation and the amount of women that are entering specific industries. So it might not be so much that in your industry that hey, it's not like we're not open to hiring a woman, but a woman, but we're not having that many applicants. Um, to your other point, great point, because I think really the basis of all of this is communication, um, which I didn't have, you know, when I was married and my kids were little, but having that open communication and allowing yourselves to be vulnerable, both the men and the women to have that conversation is really the key. And we're going to talk about that a little bit later. So is it Marty? I can't see your name. Yeah. Thank you so much. Cause that was, that was a great interjection. I really appreciate it. That was some great points you made. Um, And to your point, um, this company right here, I'm showing you the results of is a fortune 100 company I'm working with currently. And the uh, VP that I work with is a female um, in her thirties, probably the sharpest woman I've ever dealt with. And she works and her husband is kind of stay at home dad. Her husband doesn't work in his job. I mean, he works, but his job is the kids and the house. And he, the way she says it is he executes 
you know, on the household stuff and she is the one that works and makes the money and they've had that conversation. So to your point, Marty, you know, that, that is seen out there quite a bit and more so lately, but in this company in particular, I wanted to show you some of the results because I had been working with this company for two years. Um, they are really trying to shift their culture. And one of the things that we've done is we've created an internal women's leadership program to help build the skills and knowledge and change the mindsets that I talked about for the women in the organization, because we did some research. And these were some of the things that the women in this particular organization were lacking that really fall parallel in line with some of the things that research finds. Um, their lack of being able to think strategically and apply strategy was a downfall. Having the confidence in themselves and their abilities, some of these women not even some, all of these women that I work with in this organization and that are in this program are amazingly talented, but the confidence in themselves is very low. Their self-regard is very low. And so that's something that we're working on building. Um, the networking outside of their small circle, a lot of them work in specific areas of the organization and they know that very well and they know the people very well, but a lot of them don't know how to network outside of that. And so it's teaching them how to do that. Later, I'll talk about one of the things that um, women do that kind of get in their own way is we know how to network well for the organization, but we don't know how to network well for ourselves. And so that's something that we're working on with these women as well. Influencing skills is another big one that came up, being able to influence up in particular. All of these women were great leaders with their direct reports, but influencing up was an issue. And then their business perspective, which is you know how we can move up the ladder in this organization, we really don't know how. And so those were some things that really, really came up um, when we did the research in this. And now Kathy's asking a good question here. Um, share some information on the book that I'm working on. Um, some of the coaching clients struggle with imposter syndrome. I will, if you don't mind, I'm going to get to that in a little bit um, because I am going to bring that up, Kathy. So thank you for that. And remind me if I don't. Um, um, we'll, we'll just, we'll kind of bring it up here because one of these things with the confidence piece is the imposter syndrome. Okay, and imposter syndrome, I think most of us know what it is. It's kind of feeling like a fraud in what we do. And a lot of it is tied to confidence. A lot of it is tied to our perceptions and how we're looking at things. You know, our perceptions, like I said, are our reality. Perceptions really have a higher percentage of effect on our mental and physical health than the events themselves, because it's the perception and how we see it. And imposter syndrome, it's almost like women um, and men, because there's a lot of men here, that have it as well are wearing glasses. And so I'll tell you a story. So a, a friend of mine who is a male who used to be a CFO of a very, very large um, insurance company that is a good friend of mine now. And he has since retired. He has been retired now for two years. Um, him and I had a conversation just recently. And one of the things he said to me, he was very vulnerable in our conversation as we we're talking about my work. And we started to talk about imposter syndrome. And he said, Chris, you know what? He said, before I retired, he said, it was always a race for me between my retirement date and when they were going to find out I didn't know what I was doing. And this man was brilliant. When I tell you, I worked with him for years. He was absolutely brilliant in what he did, but he had this imposter syndrome. And he said, I felt like it was a race. Like I needed to get to that retirement point first before they figured out I was a fraud. And so this happens with men and women. And one of the ways it caught up with him later from those years and years of stress and that mental anguish of this battle he had in his head with himself is that a year after he retired, he had a massive anxiety attack and could not figure out what stemmed from it. And sometimes when we step out of a situation that's very stressful, and then we start to allow ourselves to relax is when those emotions I talked about earlier have a chance to release. And that's what happened with him. And so this is huge and comes up constantly with women. There is not nearly enough research on it. And Kathy, I'm in the middle of doing research now um, at the beginning of the process, but this is my next book. And so you will see articles and blogs, and there's a way you can follow me and follow my blogs and all of that that we'll talk about a little bit later um, that I talk about quite often because it's huge and it has to do with mindset and our perception. So big, Thank big you. piece. You're welcome. Thank you for asking the question. And so um, I'm checking the time here. I still have 30 minutes, right, Laura? Um, go ahead. I know some of you might have to jump off, but I know that we are recording here. And so here's what I'd like you all to do. Um, I'd like the men and the women to do things with this. So you guys know how to get to your little raise your hand icon. 
It's in the, I think the uh, reactions screen down there. So as I talk about each one of these, I want you to raise your hand. Um, women, let me know if you experience this and men, I want you to do the same thing. So let me know if this comes up for you. And then I also want you to, as, as the men in the group, I want you to be aware as we talk about these, because these are statistics, this is research of where women get in their own way. So I want you to become aware of these. And I also want you to just think of how can I support the women around me, whether it's my significant other, the women I work with, the women I come into contact with daily, how can I support them and help them in these areas going forward, all right? So women, um, and men, doubting your own potential is a huge one. How many out there have doubted their own potential at some point? How far they could go, what they could do, all of these hands going up here. So just about every single one is going up. All right. This is connected to imposter syndrome as well, this doubting your own potential. This is something that I think we all do. It is something where we need to learn to stand and ground ourselves in our own greatness and our own uniqueness. Our society has taught us to compare ourselves to other people, especially in the workplace. Um, that's where we start to doubt. You know, I have my conversations with my CEO, Tommy, all of the time where technically because I'm an entrepreneur and I've been an entrepreneur for a very long time, I should be looking at my competition and I never look at my competition. And the reason I never look at my competition is because this creeps in the minute I do. I start to doubt myself. I doubt my own potential. I look at what other people are doing. I should be doing that. You know, I, I always talk about we should on ourselves all of the time. Um, and it's the worst thing you could do because that's when you start to doubt yourself. And so this is something that is, has to do with emotional intelligence and being extremely self-aware of when you're doing this and shifting the conversation in your head. Really watch the self-talk. That is where this raises its ugly head. If you would not say it to a friend, do not say it to yourself. All right, pay attention to the self-talk and when you start to do this. This is where you talk to colleagues and you talk to others who can give you a pat on the back and tell you how great you are and say, no, you've got this. That is where they come into play and this doubting your potential. How about this second one, missing the bigger career picture where we focus more on the negatives and the positives. This is something that women do often. How many of you have done that before? Now that one makes you vulnerable to admit. I will raise my hand because I know I've done that before where you kind of focus more you know, on the negatives and the positives depending on what the situation is. And so this one doesn't seem like it's as big of a deal for people, which is good. Um, this one is where we get caught up in our own heads with things. And this ties to some of the things I talked about with doubting your own potential. What about keeping your strengths and success as a secret? Women tend to do this often as well. We don't want to sound like we're bragging. We don't want to sound like we're conceited. And this is a, a area where we get in our own way. How many of you feel like you don't talk about your strengths and successes enough? How many of you do this? I see some hands going up there. This is an area that is interesting because men um, don't seem, and, and guys, correct me if I'm wrong, you don't seem to have as much of an issue talking about your strengths and successes as women do. We tend to hesitate here a little bit more. Um, how about, and this one kind of goes with it, thinking that you must be an expert to speak up. Who has noticed that? I want to see some hands here. So maybe we've got some good people speaking up here. I love it. This one is interesting because when you look at the research on this as well, um, there's a great couple great studies out there on women applying to jobs. So, you know, Marty was talking about, you know, the number of women that applied to the job that he, they had just posted in their organization. A lot of the times what happens here is that for men, they'll look at the requirements of a job and they'll say, hey, wow, you know what? I, out of those 10 things, I got a good three or four. I'm going to go for it. For women, we feel like we need to have all 10 or we won't apply or at least nine. But we look at that list. And if this is where we focus more on the negatives and then positives is we can kind of look at where we're lacking. Like, oh, I don't have that skill set. I'm not going to apply. And that's where we need more encouragement as women in the workforce to step up and to go ahead and take that risk and realize, hey, I don't have to be an expert at this moment and know everything about that job to apply. There's some things you do learn on the job as well. Dr. Chris, yep. 
a uh, quick uh, observation. I, um, being in the manufacturing space for most of my career, um, up until just the last few years ago, uh, I see a lot of job descriptions that are still written as if they were from the 1950s, where they're looking for a second shift foreman, or you know, they're written um, in such a way that um, the language is just it's. It makes no connections it's to true. today's <laughs> world. So just want to throw that out there. Be on a lookout for your own job descriptions. Yeah, some of those, that's a great, great point, Chuck, because some of them it's like, yeah, we need to probably revisit that and, and change the language just a little bit because that's part of it as well. You know, women look at those details. Um, this uh, The other piece that women do is working with their heads down, you know, and I mentioned this earlier, failing to network for our own gain, but we focus more on the company's gain. You know, we just are there to kind of get it done. Um, we are very good ladies at relationship building and man maintaining relationships. We are naturally really good at that. Women statistically have higher levels of emotional intelligence, especially when it comes to leadership than men do. And that's not a dig to the men. It's just statistically, we lean more into that. We let ourselves be more vulnerable. So we need to use that to our benefit. We need to maintain those relationships. Networking is everything. You know, I hate to say it's who you know, but a lot of the times it's who you know. And it's forming those relationships, keeping those bonds going. That is how people remember you. And that is how you kind of move through and up an organization. And you get opportunities for things you might not have gotten opportunities for before if you didn't know that person. So use your strengths to your benefit as well. Laura, go ahead and um, if you could switch to the next one. A few more here. So women also, we see that women aren't working at the right level. And so this has to do with delegation. How many ladies out there are not so great at delegation? And I want to see just the ladies here. Where do you, who struggles with delegation? A lot of hands go up. All right. This has to do with the second one, relinquishing control. <laughs> I call myself a recovering control freak personally, um, because I know that I have had to work quite a bit. And Tommy will attest to you because she still kicks my butt every once in a while of why are you doing that? Give that to me. This is a hard one. This delegating, we feel like, you know, I could do it faster if I did it myself. Um, they're not going to do it correctly or do it the way I want it done. And this is an area where we have to work. This is working at the right level. All right. And this goes with that third one, picking up grunt work as well. Grunt work, meaning, you know, for me personally, scheduling my appointments, sending out invoices, things like that. That is not where my strengths are. Focus on your strengths. This is where assessments, the different personality assessments, if your organization does that, come in handy. They come in handy because I think that we are trained to focus more on our challenges and where we're weak than when we're, where we're strong. When we focus on our strengths, this all falls into place naturally because those things that we're really good at that we like are our strengths. We do those. We like to spend time on those. We do them very well. The rest of the stuff we need to delegate. I put a couple books out for you. If anyone hasn't read this book, Fierce Conversations by Susan Scott. She has a section in here. I used to teach this class a long time ago. She has a section in her book that talks about the delegation tree. And it is something I use a lot with my clients and it's something I personally use as well. So if you look up the delegation tree from Susan Scott Fierce Conversations, it is a great tool to help you start to delegate more effectively. Because I know I had a specific blueprint in my mind about delegating. Like I felt like delegating was just, I have to give it to somebody and they do it. And then I just pray it gets done correctly. And she has a whole different take on this. So check her out there. Um, this, this fourth one, ruminating incessantly, holding grudges, beating ourselves up. This goes with the striving to be a superwoman as well. How many women beat yourself up quite a bit with your self-talk? I know we all do. And guys, you can raise your hand too if this is something you do. But women, we, we are very self-critical. Um, we tend to, I'm working with an organization right now that is all women and ladies, I love working with women, obviously, but when I go into an organization that is all women that has zero testosterone, I cringe a little bit because there are very different dynamics in an all women organization because we do hold grudges 
Um, we, we do not handle some of the challenging situations as well as men do. This is where we can learn from men, okay? Men, you know, can have an altercation, punch each other in the nose and have a beer five minutes later. We hold on to this stuff for a while. <laughs> And this is an area where we need to work as women. There is another book, and it's an older book written by two PhDs. I'm Dr. Pat Heim and Susan Murray, and it's called In the Company of Women. Really great book about how women get in their own way and how this holds us back and keeps us behind. And then you combine that with striving to be superwoman and being everything to everybody all of the time, which I think a lot of us are burnt out from during the COVID pandemic. Um, I know me personally, back right before I started my business, one of the things that catapulted me into entrepreneurism, I was working for a publishing company and training and development this is when I was kind of in the throes of my marriage and I was not happy and my kids were little and I wanted to be everything to everyone. I wanted to be on the PTO and be a great employee. And I was traveling for work and doing everything at home and trying to make homemade bread. And, you know, all of the things you put on your plate, ladies, of trying to be superwoman. And very long story short, I ended up almost dying at the age of 33 because I was so stressed and it was so ingrained and I had no outlet for it emotionally, physically. I wasn't taking care of myself. Um, I had chronic ulcerative colitis. They wanted to remove my entire colon and put a colostomy bag on me. And I was just like, oh my gosh, if I let them do that, I know, you know how sometimes you know stuff in your bones. I'm like, I know I will die in five years. And I was only 33 at the time. And that was when I kind of took my life by the bullhorns. And I said, you know what, that's it. If I created this by being stressed and I created an illness, which I believe this is a bold statement, but I believe stress creates every illness, then it's got to go the other way. I have to be able to reverse it. And so I had to really change my mindset and my perceptions around this superwoman um, mentality and what I wanted to do and what I wanted my life to be like. And within a five month period of time with some physical work, but a lot of mental work, I completely reversed my condition was off all medicine, haven't had issues since. And that was back in 2003. And so I'm very, very cognizant of when I have too much on my plate. And when I start to feel like what I call as fifth gear, you know, and, and men and women end up here, but ladies, this is something we're very susceptible to. And so be very, very cautious of when you're feeling like you need to be everything to everybody because we can't, all right? You have to fill your own tank before you can help others with theirs. So make sure you're looking inward first with that. That's that whole, put the, the mask, the oxygen mask on yourself before others that we hear a lot on the planes, all right? So let's kind of move to um, how organizations can help here. So I wanna pause there for a minute though, before I get into organizations to see if anyone has any comments, um, any questions on some of that that we just talked about. Looking at the chat here. Dr. Sobot, this is Marty again. I have a question about that. Yeah. You no, know, you know, actually, comment first. Men go through that super man thing as well. Um, mm -hmm. I'm a victim of my own uh, problems there as well. So that's not exclusive to women. I've been told this constantly about myself. I try to do too much. But I mean, I guess from the male perspective, you know, just hearing what you're saying, uh, you know, it, it does reverberate. But, you know, at the same time, you kind of think through something. If I presented that to a woman in the same way you did, would that be accepted properly? And the answer is probably no, because it sounds accusatory of, of what you just said. Mm -hmm. So how can we as men on the other side of this assist this process without it being taken incorrectly? Yeah. So if you could hold for two more slides, because I have an entire slide and conversation. We're going to talk about how men can help. Can you, can you hold and bring that yeah, back definitely, up for definitely. me? Yeah, yep. it's just like everything is all the points you just hit. Literally, I'm like, okay, I deal with that. That's me. That's me too. Yeah, ab absolutely. Yeah. So, and all of them, men can do the same exact thing. Here's the difference. The difference is, is that men and women's perceptions are different. Their minds literally work differently how they process. And so even though we might be experiencing the exact same things, we're not experiencing them in the exact same ways. And that's where that communication, that vulnerability and that ability to be able to really have those vulnerable conversations and talk to each other about that. 
come in handy. And it comes, it, it is where we work together to move this forward for both men and women. And so we are going to talk about that. Can you just give me a few seconds here? Yeah, absolutely. We're going to, we're going to definitely dig into that. And I want to hear thank everybody's you. comments on that. Yeah. Thank you for bringing it up. So some things with organizations, um, and we'll kind of move through this a little quickly because I do want to get to the last slide, which is what Marty is talking about. Um, what can organizations do? So this is based on some research um, I've done and other organizations have done. Ensure that women have equal access to skill development opportunities. So as I mentioned to you, you know, some of the organizations I work with actually create programs to help women move forward with the skills and knowledge gaps that we have. Um, some of them make those women only, some of them include men and women, which I always, always ask them. I'm like, include the men with the women because that's how you learn together. We learn from each other on this. We all have strengths and we all have challenges as men and women and that's where we need to balance that. So just making sure that there's equal access to that. Using data to highlight um, any unconscious gender bias, you know, that unconscious bias is just that unconscious bias. Um, just like the comment, um, I can't remember who it was, I think it was Deborah that you, you mentioned, um, your colleague had said it's the unconscious bias right there, didn't even realize he was doing it. So making sure that we use some data to really highlight this, you know, with organizations, ROI and numbers talk. <laughs> You know, the, the subjective data isn't as powerful as objective data, which is where the data piece comes in. Offering flexibility without any shame. Um, this again, I think has had a positive impact with the pandemic, but in the past, and I know and sometimes still now when, when women are needing that flexibility, I gave you my example of when I was between calling out sick because my child was sick or sending my kid to school sick, you don't wanna feel shame for that. Shame is one of the human emotions that really hits us hardest and leaves scars the most is shame. It is the worst, it's the emotion that does the most damage um, for us as adults and for children. And so offering that without shame in the organization, not saying you can do it and then giving you a hard time or withholding things, you know, this is where the culture needs to shift. Sometimes there's a lot of those unspokens out there in the culture that do, you know, make people feel shameful as well. Addressing gender issues head on. Um, this takes vulnerability in the organization to do this. Um, announcing like, hey, this is our focus this year. This is one of our big goals. These are one of the things that we're, we will be focusing on and taking strides. We wanna hear your feedback. We wanna hear your comments on this and really taking that head on. Trusting women, you know, holding the space for them that when women in the organizations tell you, this is how this gender gap is affecting me. This is how the wage disparity is affecting me. This is how I feel working here listen to them and hold that space for them because they're not just making this up, all right? Let them have a voice and really hear them when they talk about this. Laura, go ahead to the, the next one. Um, creating more of a gender equitable policy um, for caregiving needs and career development needs, all right? So a lot of the policies and and this, this is where, you know, HR kind of comes in and making sure like, hey, is this, is this equal? And this goes to, you see a lot of organizations now that offer paternity leave as well as maternity leave. You know, the men can also take off a certain amount of time when their wife has a baby. And so we're seeing this, this, this is equitable both ways, right? So this one is where it leans a little bit into letting, you know, men have some more of that as well as, you know, looking at what the women need more of or less of including women, and this is a big one, including women in those consulting, decision-making conversations, um, communicating with them when changes are made. Women need a voice at the table. You know, this is where Sheryl Sandberg's, um, her, her whole organization and her book, Lean In, really talked about this, us having a voice at that table and leaning in. We have to be invited to that table. And ladies, when you're at that table, don't be afraid to have that voice providing financial support. And this is a big one for organizations, for women and families. Um, a lot of organizations are doing this now because they're seeing how much the pandemic affected families, providing financial support, either through specific programs, pay increases, whatever that might look like. 
Investing in childcare infrastructure. This is another thing I've seen quite a bit is organizations actually creating daycare centers within their organization so people can come back to work. Um, really going to the women and asking, what do you need? Where are the gaps? Where can we help you, you know, really enjoy coming to work, but not worry about that your kids are being taken care of. And then this last bullet, I think is one of the most important here. And this is focusing not so much on the programs, but the culture. And as I mentioned this earlier, the programs are important. Any programs and policy changes you can make, but ultimately folks, it is the culture that shifts. Um, that the culture of our organization is what needs to shift because that is the day-to-day. -day. That is, you know, it starts at the top, it trickles down. That is where we see the most change and where we need the most change because a culture is how the organization feels. How do I feel as a woman going into this organization? What is that footprint that I feel of this culture? That is what allows me to feel confident speaking up and saying something at the table and maybe inviting myself to the table when these decision-making meetings are happening, All right, The culture, I need to have that psychological safety. And if you haven't heard of that term before, psychological safety is that I feel comfortable and confident enough speaking my truth without there being some kind of spoken or unspoken punishment, right? All organizations need that psychological safety. That is part of the culture. I'm gonna pause right there. Any questions on any of that there? That was like a big uh, organizational punch there with a lot of information. Any comments? And I did see the comment about putting the books in here. I will do that as soon as I am done, Kathy. Can I can I add something? I just also want to make sure that we're we're putting an extra special emphasis on women of color as well. Mm -hmm. I think that women, you know, it's it's like, you know, yes, make it uh, really reach out to to make gender equitable policies and and making sure that we really put a lens on our DEI yep. work. Absolutely. And thank you for bringing that up because that's true. And that that is kind of a assumption, an umbrella over all of this. Um, ID and E work is huge. Um, women of color experience this on a whole different level, an absolutely whole different level. Um, there is some great research and there's some great movements right now with this. A lot of organizations have got to focus on this. Um, so please keep that in mind. And Deborah, thanks for bringing that up because women in general is what we're talking about here. But know that each individual woman, race, creed, religion, culture that they're from, we all experience this very, very differently and at different levels as well. So thank you so much for that. So let's go ahead to the last slide. And this is where um, men can be allies. What can men do? Um, and so this kind of goes to, I think it was Marty's uh, comment earlier. So one of the things that I love to talk about with men is this empathetic leadership. So what is empathetic leadership? Empathetic leadership has to do with coming from a place of understanding and support, honoring a woman's strengths, um, honoring who they are and how they lead without judgment. Empathy is very different from sympathy. You know, sympathy is like, I'm so sorry that you all go through that in your organizations. Wow, yeah, yeah, that's tough, so sorry. I do not know one woman in this space who enjoys sympathy <laughs> in that area. Um, so empathetic leadership sounds more like, you know, wow, this must be really frustrating for you. You know, really trying to understand how they feel. You know, I'm here to support you in, in whatever way that looks like, or just simply asking, you know, someone, a female you work with, what do you need? You know, what is it that you need? What can I do to support, to help you with this? That's empathetic leadership. What that takes though, is this next one, and this is allowing yourself to be vulnerable with conversations with women. And, and guys, this is a little bit harder usually for men, just from my experience. Please disagree with me if you think that's not true. Um, allowing yourself to be vulnerable and open and sharing your own experiences and your own feelings and opening those communication channels so you can have those conversations of, you know, I want to be able to tell you you look nice today without you taking that the wrong way. How can I do that? Or, or tell me what goes through your mind. Um, you know, when, when a situation like this has happened, how does that make you feel? And having those conversations so you really can lean into this empathetic leadership. 
also speaking up when you hear about any inequalities. If you hear someone do it, if you see someone do it, speaking up, saying something. This goes. This is the same for you know all of the conversations um, in ID and E. Um, speaking up when we hear it. That is, that is our job as a female and as males and, and just as human beings to speak up when we see that. Learning from women, um, and this goes to what we said earlier, believing them when they say, hey, I have an issue and a challenge here. This is what my experience is. Learn from them, lean into that. Watch how they do things. Women have a very innate way of leading that is very different from men, both work, but they're very different. Allow, allow the women to lead like a woman leads rather than like a man leads. You know, that is again, what I found a lot in my research when I was doing my research is it was really hard to find studies that didn't compare a woman and a man um, saying like, hey, this is the ideal way to lead based on the men. And this is how women lead. And this is where their gaps are compared to the man. Well, I think we need a whole different platform where we need to start that research from confronting your own potential unconscious biases. And this kind of leans into the vulnerability piece where we might have unconscious, we all have unconscious biases. All of us do, no matter what it's around, around this topic or others. The only way we know that is to bring it to consciousness. And that's having people you trust pointed out to you or allowing yourself to be vulnerable that if someone gets upset with you and angry and says, hey, I took that the wrong way, really have that conversation and find out why. Don't immediately get offended by it, but find out why. You know, what was it about how I said about that? Um, how can I say that differently? That's that vulnerable piece there. And then mentor a woman. Um, we can learn a lot from each other. Allow yourself to mentor a woman and to help bring her along in the organization, be her ally, you know, be that sponsor, be that person who, you know, talks about her to others and, and her skill set and her strengths. Those are extremely important things men can do. What else do you all feel men can do or that you need? So ladies, you can chime in here and then guys, I'd love to hear from you. What do you think about this? And do you want to add anything? Be mentored by a woman. Chuck, I love that. <laughs> I absolutely love that. Yeah. Has anyone that had a female mentor before, guys? Chuck, have you had one? Can you want to talk about that? And Mike, you have. So what was that like? Uh, yeah, Gloria Yasasi Diaz, probably the best leader I've ever worked for. So, I mean, just it, it didn't feel like it was a, uh, a male-female um, kind of relationship. I just learned a ton from her. And I guess it it would have broken all the stereotypes or biases that would have existed. And I just thought it was wonderful. And she was just a great leader. So, um, but love she brought it. her own style to the table. I love it. Mike, do you want to chime in? Yeah, absolutely. So I had a female uh, mentor for about four years. And uh, one thing that I found out early on in the process is she had uh, four kids, which I actually didn't even realize. And because she was just constantly focused on work and she traveled, you know, all over the world for, for the, her job. And I was like completely impressed when I heard it. Um, and she was like, you didn't know that. And I was like, no, but she helped me kind of look at some things in the work world that I just maybe wasn't paying attention to as much. Um, mm -hmm. You know, exactly some of the things you mentioned, like, how are you feeling and things like that. I think I was a little bit more monotone with my teams and I didn't get um, too deep into what was going on in their personal lives and some of the things, you know, stresses they were dealing with. I did my best to kind of, you know, shield myself and avoid that whenever possible. And she was always pushing me to, you know, get to know the, you know, employees better and what they were going through outside of work as well as inside of work and how that was impacting their pro productivity and things like that. And I got to tell you, that probably helped me the most early on in my career working with her because I, I started to look at things just completely different than I, I had been before. So, you know, yeah. she was definitely one of the best mentors I've had. Love that. Thank you, Mike and Chuck, for sharing that. Um, Laura, if you could go to the next slide really quick, just one last thing I want to share because I know we only have a few minutes left here. What women who do advance, women who have kind of gotten there, and who feel they do this really well, Here's your, these are some of the things 
that that you see in them characteristic wise they work at the right level influence upward they take risks and learn new skills um, they have that belief in themselves they have a very clear and shared career path this is something i work with women a lot on um, really understanding what is it I want, what does it look like specifically, and then sharing it with others, because we sometimes don't voice that to others as well. But these are some things that women do do that have moved forward. One more slide, Laura. And so ladies, big takeaways here to take care of yourself, and we've touched on a lot of these already, is develop a career plan, have somebody help you with that if you don't know where to start. Find a mentor. Um, a role model, someone that you can talk to and bounce some things off of who's thinking you trust. Have boundaries you set, know your priorities. Remember, these get blurred a lot for women. Okay, so know where your boundaries are, know where your priorities are, make sure you're in alignment there, that your actions and your priorities are, are completely in alignment. Learn how to delegate, focus on what you can control. This is probably the biggest piece is when things happen, they feel out of control, completely overwhelmed, ask yourself, what can I control? What is in my control and focus there? We spend 80% of our time worrying about things that are out of bounds that we have zero control over. Pull that back in, all right? Take risks and focus on your mental well-being first, all right? So we could go into a whole workshop just on this slide here. So I'm gonna pause. If you wanna move to the, the next slide, Laura, I think. This is just how to get in touch with me. The next two slides on this, which Laura, feel free to share this with others, um, are all of my resources and all of the references I've used that I put this together with. So if you wanted to look those up yourself, um, I will put in the chat the name of these two books here as well. Um, and I'll actually send them to Laura too by email so you could shoot those out to people. We might do that instead. But just want to see if there's any last questions. I know some of you have to jump off, but any last questions or comments here? Hopefully, was this helpful at least? Mm -hmm. Did you get something out of this? Hopefully. Yep. Yes. Absolutely. And awareness mm -hmm. is Absolutely. Great. Can you great. put your Instagram handle in the chat one more time? Absolutely. If you could pull that slide back up. I don't know. Tom, maybe Tommy can do that. Tommy, are you still I, on? She's well, actually, what I'll do is um, I, I may not get it out tonight to everybody, but I will do my usual recap that has everything on in Dr. Sopa gave me a, approval to send out the slides. So we'll do yeah. the slides. We'll have the recording and everything. So you can go back and listen to it and then I'll get those books too from you and I'll include that in the recap. So you've got it all in one email. Yep. And if you, Chris yeah. Sopa PhD is, I know what I'm on. If you search Instagram, you should find me okay. um, that way as well. All right. Well, I'm going to real quick. I just want to remind everybody we've got two global meetings in April. It's the last one for March and um, I'm not going to take time because we're already one minute over, but Chuck, I'm going to give you the last word if you don't mind to uh, thank yeah, Dr. Sopa. Yeah, thank you. And uh, yeah, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Chris. This was great. Uh, I always say if you hire the best person in the room, we're going to look like a very diverse room. So <laughs> keep keep that in mind. Um, I've also sent out a member survey. Make sure you complete the member survey. But again, thank you, Dr. Chris. And I hope everyone has mm -hmm. a great uh, rest of your day. My pleasure. Thanks for Absolutely. having me, everybody. Thanks, thank Chris. You. All right. Bye-bye now. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye -bye. Bye -bye. Bye -bye. Thank you.